Hey everybody, JJ here. Welcome back for another Saturday of Zoom networking. I'm really, really excited about today's guest speaker. We have a guy that's really, really good friend of mine. I have had an opportunity to meet him numerous times personally. And as a result, I'm honored to call him my friend. I'll let him tell you about himself, his background. I just think this guy rocks. I think he just absolutely rocks. Uh, I'd like to introduce none other than the infamous Indar Lang from Hawaii. Indar, come on, tell us a little bit about yourself and what do you got for us today? Aloha. Thank you guys for having me. So, so stoked to be on this show again. And uh, I love this talking story and uh, sharing some of my, my strengths as well as some of the weaknesses and struggles that I went through in this business. Um, I hate sharing about myself too much, but uh, I'll kind of give you a little bit of my rundowns just to have some credibility and uh, share some of my kind of struggles in the business. You, you hear so much of how easy and how successful people never really share kind of the, the struggles. And that's what I just love learn, learning myself. And then I'll wrap it up with some, uh, uh, excuse me, we won't wrap it up. I'll give you some money tricks. I know that's a huge, huge factor in the business and places to find money. And then I'll give you some ninja tips at the very end of it all that really helped me out. Little tips and tricks that uh, I love sharing with you guys. But um, uh, the rundown of my story, uh, born and raised here in beautiful Hawaii. I uh, got a degree, uh, born very poor, generator, water catchment, born on a farm. So I come from a humble beginnings and I worked hard uh, in life. Got an engineering degree, got a business degree great. I can do electrical engineering, make 150000 a year. That's great money. Don't get me wrong, but I wanted more in my more in life. I wanted more out of myself. Um, so back in 2013, my wife drug me to um, um, one of those meetings and uh, it kind of started steamrolling. 2015, we got full time into flipping. Uh, I didn't just start off wham, bam, boom. We started um, nine months to get our first deal. And it was very disheartening. It was very hard in the beginning. Uh, I've seen so much people come and go in the business and we had to just kind of pursue. We had a deal two days from closing. This was my first deal two days from closing and it fell out of escrow and it was so disheartening. And most people would have, you know, just uh, threw in the towel kind of thing. But I took that as a learning experience. I learned the process of escrow. I learned what J1 was, I learned uh, so much, even though not getting that deal. So I took it as a learning experience and I pushed on uh, steam rolling forward. We did our first flip, first flip, bought at 700. We sold for over a million and uh, I kind of got my feet wet. And after you do that first, first deal, the best way to describe it, it's like popping your cherry. It's the best way to describe it. It's such a hump to get over. But once you do that first flip, it really changes your mind, changes your outcome. Um, since then, uh, we've done about 90 flips. My average flips about a 700 to a million. So when I say 90, it's a little different from somebody in uh, Ohio where we um, we actually have 16 houses in Ohio, but it's a little different from them doing 90. Uh, we've done about 80 million in buys and sells. Um, we have 45 door rentals. I'm a big advocate for burrs and multifamily burrs. Uh, if you guys want some tricks on that, you know, message on here, I can share how to burr in, uh, in multifamily and commercial. Uh, we're a big advocate for that. Now we are where we're at now, 45 doors. We're buying, we have about 12, 15 flips going on here in Hawaii. That's my average. About 12 million is what we're, I'm comfortable with. And I like to hold that right now. Uh, we're in six different states where we're doing a lot of wholesaling, not wholesaling, wholesaling, where we're buying it and putting on the market. Um, so those are really, really exciting. Really excited about those. Um, what else? We're buying a 98 home deal in uh, Missouri. So that's 98 single family homes, some duplexes and so forth. We're doing that one with no money out of our pocket, no private monies. Uh, really great strategy that we're learning in some of the upper level people that were around. Uh, it's a combination of a double close and some other different tricks out there. I'm really excited about that deal. 98 homes, uh, 12 million purchase. It's a pretty fun one. Um, and we're buying the block. <laughs> I made a video on my Instagram. We're walking down the street and we're literally buying the block in some of these, these homes, like house after house. And I thought that was like just so cool to say because I, I come from very minimal. So 
uh, very excited to keep growing with that. Um, and that, yeah, now we're into a lot more multifamily, of course, flipping and fixing for a while. I have a great team now. Shout out to my team out there. I have some really great guys that uh, uh, we're just growing. I just actually had my guys building out our office. We have a new girl starting on Monday. And uh, that's been my weakness of the business is growing and uh, taking myself out of it. Uh, I have a great friend who mentors kind of with me, uh, is my mentor, I guess you can say. Uh, he's got, I think, almost a 10 million net worth. And I love just taking advice from him. And he's always pursuing me and pushing me to, you know, is that something you should be doing or is that something you can hire and have somebody else doing? So really changing my mindset, hanging around with different types of people, friends like that, that uh, instead of talking about growing businesses, he's, he's talking about buying and selling companies. He's got six or seven company companies and so forth. So, you know, really surrounding myself with people with that. But so that kind of is my quick rundown of my story um we're sorry for the background we're at we're actually on a staycation here over in turtle bay um here in honolulu i mean in hawaii north shore uh beautiful resort so i actually have a real background that i didn't have to edit it (laughs) but so we've been fixing and flipping for a while and i remember when i started it was such a scary moment and i was worried about so much stuff i think i spent so much time trying to figure out my company name you know the logo and the, to me that was just all a waste of time none of that mattered the, the two big things in this business that i think so many programs don't touch on is finding a deal finding the money the rest is easy i mean you're gonna fix it you're gonna make it nice you're gonna put new tiling you're gonna put new paint that really is an easier part of it all finding the money and finding a deal is definitely the hardest part of it, this whole thing when I started, there was no one doing it big in Hawaii. There was no one doing more than like one or two, maybe three a year. I mean, we pounded out 39 last year, which is a lot in, in Hawaii. And there was no one doing that much. And to me, either it was, you know, somebody's going to do it. And somebody's going to figure it out. So it might as well be me. And I had so much naysayers about when I started that, you know, you're going to fail. You're, you're not going to make it. Uh, one of the first flips I was looking at, even my dad was like, what are you doing? This house needs to be torn down. It's horrible. It was just termite rotten, everything. And I had, a, I have a mentor, a friend, a different mentor at the time. And he told me either you make, I think at the time we we're going to make 40 grand on the deal or you make nothing. And uh, I just really took that and ran with it. Somebody's going to do this deal and make it, or we're going to make nothing. And from that start, when I first started flipping, I would take on the most challenging flips. These flips were all the floorboards underneath were all rotten. We would have to jack up the house with all these car jacks and change out all the boards underneath the house or huge, huge support beams. I would take on the flips no one wanted, super hardest flips. But to me, somebody's going to figure out and somebody's going to do the deal. And it was me. And I just made that decision right then and there that I was going to figure it out. And to, the, to this day, that's my secret. I'm going to figure out how to make this deal work. I'm going to structure it uh, financially to make it work. Whatever it takes, you really got to be creative sometimes in the business. And don't listen to people who have less than you. Big, big thing to write down there. If somebody has less money than you or you I don't take advice from them. They have to have a net worth or something. And that's just me. Uh, Because I learned early on that my family, for example, my dad's well off, you know, he makes six figures a year, which is great. Don't get me wrong. But I want to listen to millionaires. Millionaires just have this different mindset about money in general, how to grow it, how to make it, how to use it. And um, so my path changed dramatically for me when I started, uh, you know, being around people uh, people, successful people. Uh, I'm a member of other groups too, where I'm constantly learning, growing, and being a part of. Um, I, I don't know if you guys are on Bigger Pockets and follow Brandon Turner. I actually have the luxury we I go to his house and hang out with him on Sunday nights sometimes. <laughs> and follow me on Instagram. I would love to post all of those sit down meetings, but it's the type of meetings where you don't share. It, it's 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 a friendship com- camaraderie group. And man, the upper level stuff, 
I learned hanging out with these groups um, is amazing. And, um, and I love sharing with all of everybody, all the tips, trips and ticks and ins and out of the business, you know, because to me, when I started, there was no one doing it. And I just want to be that light to help other people out and see that they can do it. They can do it in any market. I mean, our average price point here in Hawaii is a million dollars. If I can do it here in this crazy high end market, you know, anyone could do it. it it's not, it's like we always give ourselves excuses or our mindset. It's really hard to change. Our mindset is, is my struggle. You know, it, that's definitely the hardest part of, for me is changing my mindset on how to do this, this business. Cause it's scary. I mean, my first flip, I was buying at 700,000. I was scared. Shit. It's like when I sleep at night. I mean, I still am scared. I'm buying a 2.2 right now and I'm not sure on my ARV. So I'm a little scared. I'm a little nervous. Um, don't get me wrong. It, 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 it's still always scary because these are big numbers. It's just we're not used to talking about these numbers per se. And so they're very scary. Even when you're dealing with 100,000, they're still scary numbers. You know, it's there's a lot to lose, a lot, a lot at stake. Um, so having a, you know a mentorship group like this is awesome, where you have friends and family to run deals by. Excuse me, not friends and family, but other people like JJ or other successful people. So I want to talk about some of the, the pitfalls and the things to look out for in this business. So it's all roses and everything we make it seem like on Facebook and Instagram and all our stories, but it's not. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of perseverance and and going that extra mile. And no one else is not. When I started, I was working a full-time job at the time. And I would spend to 12 o'clock at night watching the videos and learning and learning and putting in offers and, and, and just doing the business. And it was sleepless nights sometimes and very, very challenging to, to get the ball rolling. Um, and obviously, once you do it, it's a steamball effect. Um, now we're in a, it's a steam, it's a steamroller effect once you start getting a few deals and you start rolling but i'm not wanting to talk about that i wanted to talk about the beginning the struggle of finding a deal and finding the money so we all know the tricks to finding a deal we, you know from marketing to uh you know cold calling to working with agents uh, we get a lot of deals ourselves with agents we check our kpis we know our numbers 67 percent came from agents so we pushed that up this year. We started cold calling agents for deals. We started um, networking with agents to find us deals. We have that $2.2 million house right now. The agent is getting the buy and sell to us. We are actually going to turn it right back on and potentially sell at 2.5, not do nothing, just do a quick double close. But gives that agent uh, the ability to make a, a four dip maybe or a three dip into that one deal. Um, and it will make maybe 150 grand or something. Not that much uh, on what we want to make, but I'm happy with 150. Um, I, sh I, sh I should be more happy, but yes, that, that's, uh, that's great. But we actually just had our first $500,000 profit deal a couple months ago, uh, last month. So that was pretty exciting to have. So one flip can really turn somebody's life around. Just doing one flip, you know, it's 80 grand profit is our KPIs right now. So one flip is like somebody's salary. And I, I just want to push everyone just to do one, just to try to get one, just to do one on your spare time, because that's an extra, who want to be happy with an extra 80 grand a year, of course. Um, so yeah, back to finding a deal. So being creative in finding a deal is another huge part. You know, as JJ was just pushing before this, being on Facebook and being on Instagram and networking, huge part of this business, more so than I realized until I got in deeper into it, that a lot of my relationships and deals started coming from that. Uh, from, uh, I don't do much JVs, but if somebody brings me a JV of a deal um, to working with agents, and of course, just getting your name out there, having your name out there involved in groups, is, is just a great way to kind of get recognition uh, for so many different reasons from, from, you know, a friend will see that and they'll, Hey, I heard about this deal down the road. They'll call you up. That will happen. It will happen to a private money investor sees your name out there. 
and hey, I heard what you're doing. You know, I'd love to work with you. It, it's all about creating that that presence. Honestly, I don't even have the time. Uh, I feel like I'm not the smartest person in the room a lot of times. There's always somebody smarter than me. There's this one guy who comes to all my events. Guy knows way more than me, but he's never done a deal, never done a flip. So it's not just about knowing the, the most in the room, but it, it's about that action. Um, taking that action is definitely, definitely a hard step to take. Taking that action. But it, it's all in little steps. Uh, for me, I tell everybody this. If you ever analyze any deal and you don't put that offer in, you're the worst person ever. <laughs> you spent that time analyzing the deal, put that offer in. Our KPIs are 22 offers, 21 offers gets one deal. So we write offers just trying to get to 21. I'm not writing an offer to get the deal. I'm writing an offer to get to 21. So I just changed that little mindset because I spent the time analyzing the deal. I spent the time looking at their numbers, put that offer out there. I can be 500,000 below asking. Who cares? You put that out there. You never know. I've got the deal six months later. The agent's calling me. Hey, is your offer still good? Yeah, it's still good, but $10,000 less. Um, and they, they want it because they realize that they could not get financing. They, the deal would not work with anybody else. Um, so you, the only way to play ball is to put an offer out there. Zero offers equals zero deals. That's a big one right there. So if you're analyzing a deal, Put the offer out there verbally if you got to uh, have the agent write it up if you if you can press that agent but you won't get deals unless you unless you put offers out there there's no other way uh, to get deals to get involved and in getting the the momentum that's all we're looking for we're just looking for momentum we're just looking for that shift in life because it's very hard for me to go from what i was comfortable at with a job with life with my my set life to changing to a different type of life. Um, and it was very hard for me because I had my routines. I had a steady income. You know, we had a steady everything. It, it, it's a very different lifestyle to go into where we're at now. Um, but now we get to enjoy this kind of stuff. I'm staying in a, a thousand dollar a night of room. And, and it was a shift because it was hard to get out of my comfort zone. So more tricks to finding deals. We're going to talk about finding deals and finding money, I guess. So finding deals, you know, obviously we know all the norms. We know all the norms. But if you can start learning creative ways to structure deals, deals that wouldn't work and bringing on somebody else that could help you with that even. So I have a few guys out there in the field who are flippers and they're trying on their own. But if they have a hard deal, They'll bring it to us and I teach them how to structure it. And now they're doing it on their own and they're figuring it out. But there's different creative ways to structure deals to make it work from owner finance to subject to, to, uh, you know, reverse mortgage. There's all these different strategies that I didn't know about. And I had to learn myself. And the only way I learned was I partnered and I learned. So I'm not saying so you have to learn that on your own. You know, take a take a mentor, take a partner, take somebody expert in your market, jump in with them. My first flip, I was scared to at 700,000 purchase, couldn't even sleep. So I brought in another person um, and I partnered with them. So what? I gave up half the deal. I got to learn. I got to do, do the deal. Long story short, his family moved away. He was supposed to find the hard money of the deal. Um, and none of that happened. He left. I ended up doing the whole deal myself still honored the partnership. I still gave them, uh, still gave them our, our agreement half. I didn't even get that JV signed, but it's all about relationships. So uh, relationships are huge, even more. So I want to stress this one. Once you guys start getting into business is to always pay back your private money lenders. There's some people out there I've heard that don't want to pay back their investors and so forth. And we've had some bad deals. This is not all raindrops and raindrops and lollipops. We've had an eighty thousand dollar loss. We've had some deals that uh, went way too long and over time. And uh, you know, you just got to keep explaining what's happening in that situation, and make sure number one thing is we always pay back our investors because your name is important, especially here in Hawaii. So we can do business bigger, more and more. So you just got to suck it up, Buttercup, and move on, kind of thing. Um, there's more deals out there. 
that third deal ever, we lost 80 grand. And I, that was a kick in the balls. I felt that for a year. Believe me, I was 80 grand. Um, but that next deal, we made 90 and we just moved on. And you've got to keep that, that momentum, that forward, that forward press in it all. So let's kind of jump into finding money. This is definitely the hardest part of the deal for me when I started. It, it was such a hang up because I didn't know how or know how to do it. So of course, so when I first started, hard money wasn't readily available like it is now. Hard money would only lend to you unless you had deals under your belt. They were at 12 to 15% rates um, was the norm back then, high points, high so forth. And they would only lend unless you had a deal. So for us, finding hard money was, was a little struggle. We partnered with somebody. I used to make big JV agreements with other investors just so they can get hard money lenders to, to work with them. Um, so, you know, being creative and in, in working with hard money. Now, if you guys can't find a hard money lender, go on to what I did, actually. We just, uh, March in COVID, when every hard money lender was shutting down, when it worked with anybody, I went into bigger pockets and I and I had, a, I had four deals lined up all right then. And I BCC'd about 30 something hard money lenders because my main one, uh, lending one is who I was primary with. They shut down. They weren't lending anyone. I still today BCC all my hard money investors. Uh, if I got if I got a great deal, I'll send a BCC. If you guys know how to do that in your email, it's just a blind carbon carb copy. It's a way to send out a, a message, an email to everybody without the other people knowing. So I'll send out that same deal. And all you got to send to a hard money investor is three numbers, your ARV, your rehab, and your uh, purchase price. Send it out to them, uh, address, of course, and maybe a little couple sentences about the deal. You know, ask the kind of key points are your LTV, loan to value, uh, and your interest rate and your points. Um, a little couple of tidbits on that. Uh, LTV should be 80 to 90%. They'll, they'll say 90% all day, but a lot of times it comes down a little lower when it's based upon appraised values. When you hear points, more than one, more than two, if it's ever two or more, uh, run. That normally would be a broker. That'd be somebody who is brokering it for you, middlemaning it, and going to the source. So me, I like to just go straight to the source for money. I like to go... Uh, I've called a BlackRock group. I've called up uh, straight to the hedge funds and I try and get money directly from them. Uh, it's hard to do. It takes a lot of work. You got to have a big play to work with them. But I like to cut out all the middlemen. And, and I have great friends here and I'd love to work with them, hard money lenders, but it's nothing personal. It's just whoever has the best rates. Um, you know, this is money that's going to go to my family. So I, I appreciate every dollar because that's a dollar away from my kid's mouth. That's a, that's a dollar away from my son. So I fight for every dollar. Uh, I just grew up like that, I guess. So working with hard money, make sure you understand that. You know, Send a deal out to all of them. Find the best, lowest interest rate. Um, you want to be around an 8%. You know, we're in the sevens now uh, for interest rates. If you're at nine, it's, it's fine. Um, you know, a point or two, look for. And then, of course, look for your LTV. That's kind of your most important things when you're kind of shopping around to a hard money lender. Make sure you understand that and look at that. If you're in a big market like ours, make sure you understand a couple other little factors. This is a big one. It's called Dutch interest. If your hard money lender is going to charge you interest for your rehab budgets up front or throughout the loan, this could be a matter of ten dollars to $20,000. So that's a little thing to understand is are they going to charge you interest on, you know, we have a rehab budget of 400,000 right now. They're charging me interest on that up front compared to later on. You know, that's a big difference on who I'll decide to work with. Hard money all day long is easy to fund, find from our, you know, we're doing these $12 million purchases. They're, it's easy to fund deals because they're going to fund on the deal. If you got a deal, lenders will fund on a deal. So that's the first, first thing is make sure it's a deal, of course. They don't care about you. They care about the deal. And that's why we use hard money. They're called uh, non-recourse loans, meaning they're not caring about us per se so much. You got to have a good credit score. That's about it. But they care about the deal. They want to make sure you have a deal. Um, they want to make sure your numbers look good. Your contractor 
numbers look good and so forth. And then you just gotta press the paperwork through and get the deal closed. Um, uh, hard money lenders, if you guys wanna write these down, uh, I like, um, of course, Civic's been around for, every, any, for everybody. Um, I would stay away from them at this point. They've been really difficult to work with, uh, a lot harder. Um, check out uh, Lending Home is huge. Uh, Anchor is great. They're kind of busy right now. Anchor Loans, they're just desktop appraisal. They don't require, they don't require a appraisal up front. Uh, uh, what is our Finances of America are great. Um, and Temple Valley is great. I was with uh, Temple, uh, Lending One in Florida, but uh, I've since left from them. I was their largest client. They love to work with us because the, the volume I give them. So I kind of throw my weight around and, um, you know, use that, you know, throw your weight around when you're working with these lenders. Um, so that's kind of some of the hard money lenders. Now let's get into the harder side of it. Finding the gap funding. How do I find the 20, 25% that I need to fund the rest of the deal? How do I find that? And of course we all know friends and family. We're going to go, Make sure you're, you're networking, you're talking to your friends and family, you let them know what you're doing, what you're up to, you know, you keep people involved, you know, to, uh, throughout this process, because then when you finally do get a deal, you, you present a, you know, you just kind of start talking about it. And I went through all these different sales classes and all these different things. There's no better way just to have a human, human conversation with people be, you know, just be genuine, genuine and true. It's the best way to, for anything we do and, and from cold calling to whatever, I think just being a generally human, human person outweighs any of these sales tricks that they, they see. For Because for me, I start like stuttering and I start like thinking about it and I start sounding robotic. But if I just be a real person and talk to people, you know, that's the only way for me to, to make this business work. And and that's just, I guess, my Hawaii way. So I'm very upfront with everyone, all my private money investors. I'm very open about it. I'm not pushy but at all. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's an open relationship where I talk to friends and family, I talk to other coworkers, other people out there. You know, what we're doing, what, what the deal we have coming up. Hey, check out this deal. You want to be a part of it. This is the numbers. I, I have a very open book kind of, uh, per persona about the whole deal that when I send out to investors, I'll send out everything from how we acquired a deal, what we're going to do with the deal, the things we're scared about on the deal. Uh, we make a very detailed investor packet that I'll send out to the investor about the deal. Just a few pages, as long as with the links and the comps and so forth, and pictures of the deal, uh, what we're going to purchase, what we're going to rehab, and then what we're going to sell for. So, I have that great relationship with people now that I don't need to be pushy with them. And um, if you guys know Jason Bible on here, he, he's a great mentor, a friend of mine. He's done thousands of flips. And he actually has uh, like pages of investors and he tells them, hey, where do you want to be on, on, you know, in my investor group? Where do you want to be? I have the next deal coming up. Do you want to be at the 10%, 8%, 5%, 4%. So that's a good strategy I would recommend to use. And once you start building up more and more investors, um, I probably should do that, but I just, I just do 12% across the board. I'm actually pretty high. The norm is eight to 10%. You guys should offer out there. I do offer more because I want people to invest with me long-term. I want to be, in, be around and do more with me. So I do offer 12, which is more than the normal of the, of the business, but um, you know, we're looking for long, long term with a lot of people. So, so what you got to give up, um, backtracking to one more thing. So when you find a deal, a lot of times we're scared and we can't, we're scared to do the deal because we can't find the money. We can't talk to, you know, two friends, your family, lock up the deal and partner with somebody. That mentor friend of mine, he's, he, he always told me, you know, you either make nothing or you partner with somebody, you make half. So what? You're going to make a $40,000 profit. You split that into 20. You got to learn. You got to be a part of a deal. You got that, that, that security of working with somebody who's in this business who uh, should know what they're doing. You know, obviously don't partner with a newbie person, you know, bring up expert into it. Um, you know, 
call me, message me. I, I talk to people all the time about if it's a deal or what I think. It's just my thoughts. I'm very conservative in this business. Um, and back to your numbers. If you guys are conservative in this business, don't let anyone tell you differently. This is how you last in the business. We've been doing it now six, seven years straight, just solid flipping. Um, and because I'm conservative, I'm able to last. I see a lot of people come and go, but conservative is the best way. Right now, everybody should be flipping right now. There's no, this is how I pick my ARV. <laughs> it's it's pretty, um, pretty easy to sell flips right now. So, but you know, when that market does change and goes back into our normal market, um, uh, you know, you got to be ready. So making sure you're conservative then or conservative looking at a deal, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it, it, it will save your butt for the long run uh, because, yeah, one one negative deal will just it can you know, change for the worst. But, OK, so working with private money investors, working with them, helping them find you know, maybe they have some higher rates. Maybe they do have the money, but they want half the deal. Keep that in mind because it's all right to do that. Uh, I've had deals where um, I had to raise my gap funding for a deal was 600000 That was just a gap for the deal. And I had so much flips going on and I was still 300 bucks short. I had two weeks to raise 600000 Couldn't do it. I had this guy who gave me 300,000, but he wanted a quarter of the profit. So I was like, man, nah. you know, I couldn't do it. Two days left from closing. I have 15 grand at stake. I'll just bring him in, just do it. So what? He gave him 25% of the profit um, and, 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 and just moved on because I valued doing the deal. And to me, just doing the deal, making something of it is a lot more than making nothing. So don't be scared to partner with it, to give up half the deals. I, there are some other big investors on here that I've known that actually give up a lot of their deals that they're not sharing. There's a lot of investors out there that give up um, half their deals. And so don't don't be scared to do any of that. So yeah, we all know these two sources, hard money, private money, but let's talk into some more things. Uh, of course, we got, we got HELOCs. If you got friends and family, you can start talking to them about getting home equity lines of credit on their home. Bake. Anyone can do this as long as they're homeowners. They can get a line of credit off their home. They can borrow that money. They can help fund you for a deal. My brother, for example, had 200000 on his house that he can he can borrow. Borrowed 200000 He took it out of his home. He needed a new roof at the time. I said, hey, 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 Ganesh. My brother's name is Ganesh. Um, let me borrow the 200000 I'll make you twenty grand off of that money in about a year. Made him twenty grand. He was able to buy a new roof with that money instead of putting that twenty grand into you know his roof and being that much more in debt. So you know, figure out win-win solutions for people are definitely how to pitch it. And you're just being honest and you're being real about, about people what you can do. Um, so HELOCs are a great way. There is also PLOCs, personal lines of credit. This is a great way. When I first started, I went to the bank. Is open a bank account, put a hundred dollars in there, make sure it was a business bank. Now this bank has to be a small bank. It has to be a very small bank in your, in your part of the world, wherever you guys are, whatever state, maybe it says something state on it. For all we know, that's a great bank. Credit unions too are available. Um, but if you're in Hawaii, anyone in Hawaii, uh, American Savings, Central Pacific Bank, these are smaller banks that have lines of credit. They have, have like 50,000 lines of credit that they'll give to your business and their personal lines of credit that will help your business grow and very easy to get. They don't ask for tax returns. They don't ask for anything. They ask for you to fill out the paperwork. And when you got a great banker, like my buddy that helps me, he tells me what to fill out on the paperwork to make those things work. Because now we are, we're up into huger lines of credit with the bank. We're trying to get very large lines of credit with the bank and they'll, literally help you with the paperwork um, and what to make it work. And I did want to make, you know, 10,000 a, a month at the time. So yes, I was making 10. So these are just the secure lines of credit for your business. And we got that, you know, 50,000 line of credit right away. So the cool thing about that is it doesn't show up on your, you know, not no statements or nothing until you pull it. 
So you can have that line of credit there. And even anyone buying their own personal house, you can actually use that as your down payment for your own personal house. After, you know, they might ask you where it comes from, but um, figure that out. <laughs> I'll tell you tricks. But finding, uh, you know, getting that personal line of credit is a great way to fund gaps. It's a great way to get uh, 50,000 line of credit. And another trick to that is a lot of them are like 50,000, 75,000 is kind of what they, uh, their maxes. You don't ask for the max. For us, we ask for 25,000 line of credit and then we upped it later. So when you don't ask for the max, you come in halfway, it's a lot easier. They're like, oh, he's not asking for the whole thing. He just asked for a little bit. To them, you know, it's, it's a lot less. So a lot of the banks will either require you to be there for a year. Some of them will just have, it's better to kind of have an account open, you know, so what you put a hundred bucks in that account, it doesn't cost you nothing. Um, it's a great, great way. To, it does take a little time, you know, working with banks is not the quickest, uh, quickest thing ever, but it's just a great way to get that open, get that ready, available to use it for something. And yes, you're going to have to pay interest on it. Uh, at the time it was 2%. I think they're up to uh, four or 5%, something like that. But if that can generate, you know, a ton of money, then do it. You know, I'm not saying to use that to go buy a TV or a car. I'm saying to use it to generate you money, just like the HELOC. I'm not saying to use that to buy a TV or a car, use that to generate money. There should be no other reason you should be using that. Um, you know, be very tactful on that. I want to throw that disclaimer out there. So that's personal lines of credit. Now let's get into more. So credit cards. There's a credit card game out there you can play. Uh, Fortune Builder used to have a company they would refer to you actually, and they would help you get all the best credit cards lines available. There's a ton of companies out there, but for free, I just went on to um, the points guy. Uh, the points guy is a, some credit card dude that tells you the best credit cards to have. And he, he flies around the world, like living off of credit cards and using the point system. So I went on there, checked out what's the best credit cards to have. Um, if you don't have a Chase, Chase has pretty much been the best for a long time. Chase, uh, don't quote me on this. I think that it changes so much. Uh, Chase Inc. and Chase uh, 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 Sapphire are kind of the two best to have credit cards. Uh, and you know, you just start getting these lines of credit. I get, I have like 10 to 15 credit cards right now that I use on my flips. I use that for my for my flip budget. You know, we have 150,000 mine of credit with different credit cards. So that was my rehab budget that, that I used. Some of the credit cards are no interest, no points uh, for 15 months, whatever it may be. So that's free money for 15 months. You know, you don't want to cancel the credit card later on. You do want to keep it open, of course, and pay that annual fee. But hopefully by then you should be able to afford that. Um, and you'll hear later, I'm actually on, you know, I'm talking about credit cards. You'll hear a lot of people talking about your credit score, of course, and trying to have this perfect credit score. Um, that's wrong to me. <laughs> You're not trying to have a perfect credit score. You're trying to use your debt and, uh, excuse me, your credit cards to make you money. So, Ideally, you actually want to have a credit score around the 730, 760 because you're using your credit score. You're not paying everything off and not using it. You're using it to make you money. You shouldn't be, again, buying TVs, cars, and stupid stuff. You're using this to make you money. So as long as you're using your credit cards and things properly to make you money, yes, your, your credit score won't be in the 800s. Mine fluctuates. I am at a 600 last month. I'm at an 800 this month because I use my credit my, my credit to, to do things with. And that's the point of credit is to be used, not to be touched. And this is just my opinion, guys. You know, if you guys have your own opinion, by all means, um, my opinion nowadays is to make money work for you. The old school way was to, you know, buy a house, pay it off and buy a house and pay off. Now my way is to leverage money and make it work. So this is just my opinion. And I think it's a new age of society today. But so credit card game, you can get all these credit cards, you can get these lines of credit. And uh, there's a website called Plastic, P-L-A-S-T-I-Q. It's a plastic with a Q, Plastic, 
And you can use that website to take cash out of your credit card. So for example, my Chase, uh, Chase Inc, I have 25,000. I can use plastic. It costs 3%. There is a charge. My credit card company will charge me my 15%. But, but now I can take out 20,000 in cash to, to do a deal or to use it in a rehab if I need that cash, um, you know, to put it as your deposit. Um, it's just resources to have available to get money. Now we we are leveraging money. This is what we do. We're experts at leveraging money to make money. You know, we are leveraging bank money. We are leveraging hard money. We're leveraging private money to make us more money. So this is just another resource to have in the back of your mindset to work with credit cards. Credit cards are, you know, out there. Uh, so just have them ready available. You know, it doesn't, I apply all the time. That's the one down. So I have like 50, no, 35 poll, credit polls on my credit, you know, it does affect your score, but not too bad. I'm at 806. So that's not the bad worst part. Um, so, you know, credit card is a great game. Um, uh, what's another good, uh, of course, go on to points guy. He'll tell you the, the good stuff. Um, American Express and all of them, of course, have some good ones too. You can also do checks. Some of them have checks where you can actually use, write checks and give them to your contractor. I've done that too. Um, just to have those resources available. I'm not saying you have to use them. Just have them available. Uh, and next, let's get even more complicated. So we'll leave the last part. Well, when somebody, you're going to start getting a lot of emails from people about, hey, we'll give you money if you guys aren't already. And I'm always very wary of it. It's one of those industries where there's so much scams out there. There's so much like who to believe and who not to believe. I'm sure you guys know the feeling like, is this a scam? You know, they're, they're calling me. Uh, I'll give you cash in two days. Like, yeah, go mess, go mess off. Like, yeah, stop calling me. So who not to believe and who not to believe. Here's one thing to think about. If they ever talk about factor rates, factor rates are very expensive money. I've tried it. I've tried it in a pinch and uh, they're talking about factor rates and they will talk like 1.25 or whatever it may be. They're, if they ever talk about factor rates, just run. <laughs> uh, money is available right now. Very easy to get. Uh, funds are open. Money is available. Uh, so just run if you ever hear that. But just disclaimer so you know what about factor rates. It's a different way of they're talking about interest, basically. Um, there is there is money out there for different companies. And I'll give you guys some names. Golden Sa Golden Sachs by Marcos. Uh, they have a uh, line of credit you can get, and I've used them. Uh, I think it was thirty thousand line of credit, and it's just like that PLOC I was explaining before, but it's a personal line of credit where you can get that, and you can get that available. And again, the cool thing about these ones are they don't charge you until you pull it. Um, some of them are it, it's like a one-time thing. The Golden Sachs is a one-time use thing. So it's not a line where you can pull and use. You, you use it one time and that's it. Um, other ones, it, it's a line where you, it's like a revolving bank account, which is awesome. Like the, the personal line of credits are revolving bank accounts where they use and uh, you can use it. It's action takers out there. This is all the businesses. So there's going to be maybe 5% of you to actually, actually go out there and do it. And when I hear that for myself, I was always the one, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go get it done and figure it out. To this day, that's my biggest, biggest, biggest thing is I just get things done right away. Whatever I, if I hear something, see something, I'll, I'll just do it now instead of later. <laughs> and that's, I guess, my biggest, biggest thing is we just get things done now. And if you guys hear anything that helps you and you really want to do it and you're pushing off for later, just go do it now. Um, so that's kind of a little rundown on getting money, you know, from the different sources. Of course, um, you know, there's no right way or wrong way and you guys have your own money. But just having these available is, is a great resource, especially, especially when you're trying to, to grow in this business. And uh, that's the part I want to now jump into 
is the growing part of this. Um, we grew from one, two flips a year, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, doing at a time. And, and we kind of just jumped into doing like 15 flips at a time for us. And we were carrying um, 12 to 15 million at a time. I had a mortgage payment kind of went back down of 60,000 a month in mortgages and we were blowing 150,000 a week. So it was very cumbersome to, to check numbers and to figure out numbers and a uh, huge, some learning key points that I learned at the beginning was um, here's some little more advanced stuff, but for you guys out there who's done some flips is uh, when you give a rehab budget to your, a uh, hard money lender, you're going to give them a rehab budget of say a hundred thousand. And I was very honest at the time. I said, okay, you know, our windows would cost five grand to install. Our demo was three grand and our permits were this. So you have to kind of break it down and give it to your, to your hard money lender. And then you get uh, polls as you do work. So your hard money lender doesn't give that, that rehab budget to you up front. They give you in draws and polls as you do the work. So you have to do work. You got to then get an inspector out there and they inspect it and then they release it. So it's never like right away. A lot of times in the construction world, a lot of the money does go in up front. So a lot of times it doesn't look like a lot of work is done, but you probably just blew through 30 grand like no other. So for us, that was fine when we're doing one and two, but when you're multiplying that in 15 projects, and I didn't factor in that I had to float 30 grand out there. <laughs> I squeezed my butt pretty hard at that, those months. So, you know, factoring in that you have to have money out there. So two things changed for us. One, our hard money lender told us front loading. You guys will hear that sometimes. So front loading a deal is, okay, my demo, the things I'm doing up front, my demo uh, my demo is 15,000. My permits are 10,000. My windows and stalls are 20,000. So the items I would do up front, I would front load into being more cost, more costly. So I can get more of the money up front and use it then and not have to carry that as much, especially when you're 30 grand times 15 and you didn't factor into that money. So those are two big, big tips. I want to put it out there for anyone who's been doing deals for a while and been around this business is to front load and to, um, you know, factor in that cost. So, you know, factoring in those, take a quarter or even a third for your rehab, make sure you have that into your gap funding and, and all those interest payments for the uh, $2 million property. You know, we're going to have a mortgage payment of uh, 15, probably 15,000 a month. So if that carries on 10, 15 months, we want to make sure we covered that interest payments as well in there. So in a smaller deal, these things are not that big deal, but you do want to cover it, make sure it's in there and just have it in your thought process to think about um, because I'm a penny pincher as you guys should be and fighting for every dollar, make sure you understand every dollar. So even in a hundred thousand dollar deal, which we do, we, we are, I just bought a $10,000 house in Ohio should have put it on a credit card. That would have been cool, right? But I bought a ten thousand dollar house that we were uh, selling at forty five thousand. Um, so we uh, we understand every little number, and we I think it's important to do that um, to understand every, every little number of the deal and make sure to be the expert of the deal. Um, little ninja tip here too be that expert of that deal. So any deal that I'm looking at, I am the expert. I know what's sold in that neighborhood. I know what's withdrawn, what's, what's active. And I I want to be that expert. So say I'm selling it, an agent comes to me. I'm not an agent, by the way. An agent comes to me. I want to know what withdrawn, what happened, what, what's active. Maybe I'm buying that deal and I got investors that are going to invest with me. They looked up something in that neighborhood and they're asking me, you just want to be that expert on every deal because it's nobody else's money at stake, but it's your money. So when it's my money at stake, I want to make sure I am the expert on that deal. I want to understand that neighborhood. 
that street, what's sold, what's bought. You guys can. Zillow, you can figure it out. You can do some research. I, I look up Zillow. Whoever says Zillow is horrible, I look it up. It's, it's a great resource to fill your head with knowledge. I look up Zillow. I look up Redfin um, for our mainland deals that we're in six states right now flipping. Uh, we'll you we use PropStream. PropStream is great. We can look at neighborhoods. You can go on Zillow for free and see what the house is sold on Zillow. There's a way to do it. You can see what house is sold or what their Zestimate is. And then I'll look at tax appraised values and, of course, comps. Because, again, this is my money at stake. No one else's. So if this deal goes south, the realtor doesn't lose. The, whoever doesn't lose, I lose. And I've had that a lot of times where a realtor would tell me the ARV is, you know, whatever number. And they're way off because they were looking at the house on the ocean and our house is three houses back. They didn't, they didn't check that. Or they're, you know, oh, they, oh we, could, we could push to that. Right now, yes, you can push to things. But, you know, even 2018, you can do that kind of stuff. So, you know, just knowing the market and understanding what's going on, it's an hour of research. Take the time, you know. And you weigh out all those different information you're receiving in your head. And I'm constantly asking and knowing about, uh, again, we're in six different states and I have a team now just totally running that. But I'm constantly just asking them about the numbers of the deal, where the numbers are at. Um, not so much of the deal itself. I just want to know the numbers. So I um, just to the bone really want to press that one to be the expert. But let me just talk about my list of uh, ninja tricks that I love to share with you guys that I've just learned throughout the business. So here's a here's a big one is to hire, especially on a big project, because you're doing any high end type or projects to hire home inspection at the end of your contractor's job. Not when you're selling it, but to hire a contractor, a uh, home inspector, excuse me, um, to give them a punch so a home inspector is going to come through they're going to put on that suit they're going to climb in that attic they're going to get the flashlight out i'm not going to do all that yes i walk around and i'm nitpicky of course but the home inspector he's going to give that 100 page report to you it's going to cost you it's 700 maybe on a high-end house for us um it'll cost it that's 700 even though i'm thinking 700 it's really saving me thousands actually when I sell a $3 million house, that investor dude is very savvy dude. There's no reason that guy is a millionaire, not for being a slump. He's a millionaire because he's a savvy dude. So he's going to ask for a credit the second he sees any little thing. So if I just caught every little thing, and there might be something I missed, the home inspector misses like a, a paint chip or something like that. But as long as you caught those major water leaks, those major electrical, you're, you really just prevented anything to be brought up to him so i hired that at home inspection give me that 100 page report here you go contractor this is your final punch list you make sure everything is done before i pay you uh, and then that way you just cut everything it's worth the 300 400 bucks every penny of it uh, especially if you're doing i would recommend anything over five hundred thousand. Um, we don't have any houses like that here in Hawaii under 500,000. But uh, when we do condos and stuff like that, um, definitely worth to, to hire a home inspector and to give it give it to them. Um, that's a huge, huge one that really helps. Uh, here's another one. So when we sell a home, and any agents out there, this is a great one too to see if your clients will offer. When we sell a home, we have... We know our numbers. We have a daily holding cost. I am paying hard money. I'm paying investors um, $300, maybe $500 a day. It costs me to carry a house no matter what. If that house is sitting there doing nothing on a Sunday, right? Today, Saturday, I have guys working. But tomorrow when, when most of the guys are not working, I, it's costing me most of my house is 300 bucks a day. It's costing me just to sit. So I know my carrying cost. So when I sell a house... I will always ask the sellers, hey, I'll give you a 50, 100. I'd normally use $100 credit to close a day faster. So every day you close faster, I'll give you 100 bucks. Now that will push them to push their lender to close faster. And I'm saving money. 
So I'm saving money by clo- having that deal close sooner when I give them a credit to, to close sooner. So you, your, your mindset is like, oh, I'm giving up a hundred bucks. I'm not giving up a hundred bucks. I'm really winning over, you know, whatever, hundred minus 300, you know, 200 bucks. So, you know, that's a great little tip to, and maybe a, a smaller end home, 50 bucks. But, and, we, and for the agents out there asking how to do it, we actually do it outside of escrow. We'll just tell them verbally and that will credit them at the close. So you don't have to do it in escrow. But it's a great tip to help push a deal close faster. And we all want to close faster. They want to move into the house faster. You want to get out of the house faster. It's always the, the, the lender that's taking so long. So it'll give them incentive to push and get all their paperwork into the lenders and, and to get it closed. Um, so that's a huge, huge one that I love sharing about. Um, we're all scared in this business. So take the time and educate yourself on every trait that you do, everything. Uh, you know, I learn, I learn about the different traits. Um, I, I actually like construction myself. I have a contractor's license. So I learn a little bit about every trait and that way I can talk to a contractor and um, forgive me any women out there, but contractors will tend to try and I'm just generalizing here. They do it to my mom. <laughs> they will eat you alive trying to push the numbers. So if you can get a little bit of understanding and the best way, if you're not going to do the work is the reason, you know, why we get three bids out there because I'll use that first bid and I'll use everything he says to talk to the second guy, to talk to the third guy. I've used contractors that came in before and said, Hey, this is a great idea. We should do this to the house. But his bid was super high. His bid was super high, but now he just gave me a great idea to use. So a lot of times, you know, getting those three bids, getting to understand uh, the trade that you're working with is is worth it. It'll save your it'll save you money in, in the long run. And to understand the lingo, the words to use, um, is worth it. Um, even real estate in general, I feel like real estate is its whole language. It's it's it's, it's a new language. And for me, it was you know, escrow and closing docs and SDR, whatever. It's all a new lingo. And it still is today. Um, There's always abbreviations that you're supposed to know. And (laughs) I remember when I was, ARV was a big one when I started. I was like, what? ARV? Um, But, you know, there's so much little acronyms that you use and it's it's a new word. So learning the lingo of contractors in this deal is definitely uh, about it. Uh, A part 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 of it but let me just wrap up here we talked about front loading talked about uh you know no offers equals no deals so put in offers hire that inspector uh credit card game was some part and part of this whole diff deal um learning about trades um network 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 and do some more networking <laughs> network network and do more networking is part of it all and then uh i want to wrap it up with know what your time is worth. Um, I used to want to make a million dollars a year. We've, we've done that now. And I want to make, uh, I want to have a net worth and we'll we'll figure out my net worth is now the the coolest part of it all building our networks. So with that said, what is my time worth is my time worth. I actually like installing grass. I like getting out there and doing actually the landscaping. I like being the earth connected to it. Um, is my time worth 15 bucks an hour installing grass? You know, is that what my time is worth? I think I am saving that, but really I'm losing that because I should be looking for deals. I should be looking for more investors. I should be uh, valuing my time. If you guys want to make a million dollars a year, you need to be making 500 an hour or 84,000 a month. So, you know, making that time worth critical in your head it it really will help you press you to is my time valued at doing this Uh, because i did jump in there and i did do the construction on our first deals uh, because i thought it was saving money and i'm guilty of it i have a bag of tools in my truck right now and i'm guilty of it all the time because i think it's worth it me to drive and go change a door or something but it's not and I think I'm saving money, but it's not. And um, I struggle with that today. But that's pretty much just a bit. I hope I didn't share too much. I do throw it out there. Sorry, I want to follow me on Instagram, Indar Hawaii. 
I do uh, trying to share a lot more and help a lot of people on there. Message me on that thing.